Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But woe mongers, woe mongers, mongers, and adulterer God will judge. Let, let, let's break this down. I used to be confused, Michael, because when I used to see it, he says marriage is honorable. So I used to think he's saying that we should honor our partners. That marriage, we should honor, huh? That's what I thought. And there is no doubt that you should honor your spouse. Right? But that's not what this place is talking about. This place is saying marriage is honorable. The institution of marriage. What makes marriage? So I studied what that word honorable means. Do you know that I found out that it means costly? Marriage is expensive. Marriage is costly. That's why I want to talk about the cost of marriage. Because most of us, when we were thinking about our marriage, we were thinking about the greatness of the marriage, the beauty of the marriage, and the feelings that we have, the excitement, the fact that we found our bones. Someone said, my missing ribs. Even though we discovered there is no missing rib there. We felt that we found our friend who we would live together with forever. We dreamt that our marriage would be different from that of the people that have gone before us. We knew that it was going to be gracious. You know, all those movies. That's why ladies like romantic movies. The Prince Chami has found the beauty and they lived happily ever after. The only challenge is we're still looking for our own living after. Because they didn't used to write in that movie that there is a price to what you just bought. Today, I want to share with you The cost of your marriage that you need to pay to get your dream. Now remember that in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus said, Count the cost before you build the house. Remember? Notice that the home, that's why marriage makes home, right? So marriage and building seems to be together. They, they seem to be uh, synonymous. Okay? So today I wanted to start writing the vision that you saw before you got married. And if you want to get married, what do you see? Can you write it down? Because you say, the Bible says, write the vision down. Make it plain. But in the wrong with it that reads it. The challenge is that if you don't write your vision down, how can you make it plain? Then if you don't have a vision, how can you run with it? All of us have it mentally. Mentally. But you say, even the things you don't write down, you forget. Can you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Write down your marriage vision. What are you saying? Can you picture yourself again? Now, I know you've had troubles. You can say those dreams you actually forget. No, let's get your dream back. Can you dream again? Can you dream today? If I can promise you that I will show you the way to have a great marriage. Can you write your vision on finance? What did you think you will have when you get married? You will have money to spend without limit. Can you dream about communication? What did you dream about in communication? That you guys will talk and it will all be good. Even when you have disagreement, it's going to be easy. You say your mind, they say their mind. You reach a compromise. Can you write your vision about your in-laws? How are they going to love your family? Are you going to love their family? How are they going to like you in the family and treat you like kings? Can you write things about your children? How your children will just be obedient every time. When you tell them to do this, they just do that. Can you, can, can you write about how you saw yourself traveling the world on holidays? Can you write the vision? Because I'm telling you, write the vision down, make it plain. So if you don't write it down, it will be plain. And if nobody runs with it, then don't blame them. You didn't write anything down. So there's nothing to read. You see, because unless we write a vision down, how do we know whether we are seeing the same thing? Because you see, there are two people in the marriage that makes a marriage. You can't marry yourself. The problem is that I am seeing something. My spouse is seeing something else. On its own, on its own merit, each vision is right. There's nothing wrong in it. The problem is we're not seeing the same thing. That's what they call division. division. Because, you see, I thought I'll be an international pastor, traveling the world, ministering up and down, Sunday to Sunday. My wife, unfortunately, thought she was going to be a career woman, international businesswoman also, traveling the world. What we forgot to say is that we didn't compare marriage. Who's going to take care of the children? You see, Legitimate dreams. But since we didn't write it down, we have the... So, when I'm trying to travel, she's saying, you can't go. My flight is the next day. I'm like, no, no, I booked my flight first. Die vision. 
I thought this, that, that, that was a joke. This one is true. When I used to see people, I used to see women driving their husband. So I used to think that my wife would be driving me. So I would sit down. Meanwhile, all she saw was her husband driving her. We didn't write it down. So when we got married, I, I, I would be driving. I'm like, don't you want to drive? She, she, she's like, where are we? Are we where we are going? I'm like, ah, can't you see mobile? Ah, she, you know, mobile drove to church. She's like, yeah, that's good. Ah, where are we? If you don't write your vision down, how do you compare it? I'm saying to you, write it down. Write it down. Now, after you've written it down, and when you get on, you can do a proper one. What is it going to cost you to have that marriage, to have that vision that you've written down? What are you going to give up? What is it going to cost you? No, no, no. I didn't say what is it going to cost your spouse. What is it going to cost you? I used to like it to say it this way. You know, salvation is free. How many of you are grateful that salvation is free? But you see, somebody paid for it. It wasn't free. Somebody must always pay for something. Nothing is free. The way I used to say it is that salvation is free, but God paid for it because he's the one that wanted us saved. He's the one that saw sinners that he wanted to redeem. Did you even think of salvation? Did you even think you were a sinner? God was the one that gave the best he has to get the best he wanted. And you are the best he wanted. He wanted us so bad, he decided that he was going to sacrifice whatever he took in to make sure that he had you and I. He sacrificed. He didn't say you have to sacrifice to get there. He didn't demand anything from you. He gave his best. So what I'm asking you is this. You see, God has sacrificed for your salvation. Marriage is not his problem. You are the one that decided to marry who you wanted to marry. It will cost you to build your marriage, but it will cost you to maintain it. But you see, the quality of your, what you used to build will make it easier. Some of us, you know, we buy cheap materials. It's cheap. But every two months, you have to replace it. But if you use proper material to buy, to build a house, it doesn't, what, does, it, does it break? Even though you still have to maintain it. So what I'm about to show you today is not that you pay it once. You pay it regularly. Are you ready? Are you ready? Four things. Just four things. Four things today. Hmm. Are you ready for the first one? Are you sure you're ready? Let me see how many doors we have. One, two, three. So I can escape when one guy wants to stone me. I'm ready. The first one is this. To have a good marriage. The first one is you are to love your spouse, not to change your spouse. The first price of a good marriage is to love who you married, not to try to change them to love them. Because the power to change a man is not in your hand. Let me tell you how the Holy Spirit taught me. Are you ready? She used to act like the Holy Spirit. This is the conversation that happened between me and the Holy Spirit. When I got married, I thought I had the power to change my wife. I thought it was my duty to let her know the standard. I was a pastor, the main man, wise, all intelligent. I know the right thing. I am always right. Even till today, I'm always right. <laughs> so I'm looking at this girl. She doesn't know what she's doing. I need to correct her. This is a position of a wife. This is a rule. Submit to your husband. I'm the head of this home. Abraham, Abraham told Sarah to go and sleep with another man. She obeyed. When I tell you, you obey. That's what I said. That's what I said. Then one day I was praying. Holy Spirit, this is not fair. Why are you not talking to her? She mean you are in her. The Holy Spirit said, Ah, but since you are trying to talk to her on the same thing, I can't talk to her. She will be hearing two voices. So, since you are better than me at explaining what you want, I am a gentleman. Please sit down. The Holy Spirit was sit, sit down and looking at me. I'm saying to me, let me see how far you can go on your own without me. Since you are so good that you think you can change her, you are even external to her. Me, the Holy Spirit that I'm inside her, who, the Holy Spirit who understands her history, understands her emotions, understands her language, understands what she sees, what she, why she does what she does. I have not been able to convince her to change you think by brute force, you can change her. Let us see. He doesn't struggle for authority or influence. He just sits down and he never says anything to her. 
about what I'm nagging her about. Ah, that's the husband. The same thing with the wife. We say, ah, you will just talk. Oh, yeah, I can see they're talking to me. You just talk. Let me talk. Let me talk. Let me talk. They will change. Since you are making noise, Holy Spirit is keep quiet. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit. Thank you, my assistant wife. My point is this. He made me realize that the moment I'm trying to change people, I am playing God in their lives. The moment you're trying to change your spouse, the moment you think you can change your spouse, you're trying to be God in their lives. No, don't misunderstand me. You can tell them what you like, what you don't like, but you cannot force them to change. The moment you're trying to force it and force it, you become their God, their Savior, their Redeemer. It's too much even for you to carry. Women often think they can change men when they get married. How is it going for you? Have they changed? The only thing is they got fatter. When you said at the point of marriage, for better or for worse, what it meant is that I will love you. Whether you get better, you get worse. In fact, I used to be against it because I was a, a faith preacher, confessional. Like, what's for better for worse? It's for better or for better. But until I understood what it meant, that my love for you is not based on what you do or who you are. I just love you. And I'm committed to loving you. And you see, this is all scriptural. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. If that is the bedrock of your marriage, you've got it made. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. I love it. The um, 33. 33. I love the amplified version of it. 5, 33, yeah. It says this. However, let each man of you, amplified now said, without exception, love his wife. Did you see that? Whether the wife is rude to you, whether the wife hates you, whether the wife is disobedient, whether you don't like how she talks, how she looks at you, just love her. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. Because I said last week that God is the one that established the principle of marriage. I'm coming to love. He now says, let the wife see. So let, let the wife see that she respects. I like the Amplified. You need to read it. Say respect. Say respect. Hmm. Can I talk to women? You are not the one that determine how your husband is respected. Though. They are the one that determine how they are respected. So if you go to an old man in my village and shake your old hand like this and say you are respected, they are like, who is your father? They didn't teach you where you came from. Because to them, you are not speaking their respect language. So don't tell me that you respect your wife or you respect your husband and they don't know. It's because you have not learned their respect language. That was free of charge. He said, and reverences her husband. This is key. Reverence. The only person we were meant to reverence was God. That's why I call reverend something, reverend. He means to revere. Ah. That she notices him. Huh. Notice. Did you see what I wore today? That is noticing. Regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates him, esteems him. I worship you, Lord. I esteem you, Lord. Even when you don't feel like it, you're the number one in my life. And that she defers to him, praises him, loves him, and admires him exceedingly. Not criticize him. Notice that when he says love, he's not dependent on who they are. It's dependent on you. What is love? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. That is what love is. You say, husband, this is what love is. Stop telling me you love your wife because you're not talking. This is what love is. You don't define love because you don't even know love. God is one that accepts love. God is love. God is one that knows what love is. If you're not ready to marry, don't get married if you can pay the cost. Many people think, they will get married and will not pay. Then they are complaining about their marriage. If you're not ready to do this, don't get married. If you can't pay the council tax where it's expensive, why buy an expensive house? You don't have no money to maintain the house. The house is too big for you. I want to say be a tenant. Boy, how can you be a tenant in marriage? You can't be because you're sleeping with another man's wife.
First Corinthians 2, 13. Verse 4 says, love endures long. All of us. Endures, say endures. Not endured, endures. Long. And is patient. Patient. We are good with those two. The next one is unkind. Some of us, we endure long. We are patient. But we are mean. Somebody, somebody in this church should be doing a high school like this. She's, she endures with me. She endures with me. She is patient. But she's not doing a high school like this. She's somewhere around this place. Between this place. The one that is not laughing, that's the one I'm talking about. Everybody will not start laughing. <laughs> I like it. I like it. But if you read all over there, then you now say, if you read the law, he said, love is not rude, does not act unbecomingly. That word, I was trying to check, what does it mean? It doesn't act out of character. Out of the standard of marriage. He now says this. He says, he says I don't know what I like. He said, it's not touchy. Touchy. It's not fretful or resentful. Most of us get to the place in our marriage where we resent our spouse. And we say we love them. You are lying. Raise up your hand and say, God, forgive me for I sinned. You cannot say you love and then you resent. He now says, it takes no account of evil done to you. That's the next one. You see, the reality though is that this is where Christians should have advantage over unbelievers. You know why? Because unbelievers know how the kind of love that we have. He said the love of God has been shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. That means you can love your spouse with the love of God that is in your heart. Not your own love. Your own love is, on, is, is not capable. Your own love is not strong enough. But the love of God that is in your heart, which is not your love, you can release it. And practice this. The thing is that the more you practice God's love, the stronger it becomes. But if you make it redundant, it gets weaker. So in other words, if you meditate on this, I challenge every couple that is really genuine to, be, to have a great marriage. Read this every day for the next 30 days. Morning and night. Read it every day. And then practice it. I can guarantee you that the more you practice it, the easier it becomes for you, for you to manifest it. Because that's how it works. It's by use that it becomes stronger. It is fighting against your natural instinct. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? That is the number one cost of marriage. You know, last week I said the reason why we need to get married is to express love. That's the number one cost. You must pay it. Are you ready to pay against your feeling? Because everything you do anyway has a consequence, has a price to it. If you let this love rule, it says love never fails. Over time, it will win over your husband. It will win over your spouse. This love, are you ready? I didn't say your spouse. For you. Your cost to your marriage. The second price is the price of forgiveness. Say forgiveness. I didn't hear you. Say forgiveness. But do you even understand what forgiveness means? Because we think we understand forgiveness. But I want to show you. I want to demonstrate it somehow. So how many times has this slapped them? How many? Can you count? Okay, Patrick, forgive her. Tell her you forgive her. Do it again. How many times has she slapped him? Sorry? Because all of you are thieves. Yeah, you know that I've taught you that one before. That's his why. No, no, no. He said three times, and I've taught you many times. You, you are going to, you are going to. So this is it. Though. True forgiveness means that if you forgive, there will only be a first time of sinning against you. When you forgive your husband, when you forgive your spouse, you don't say, hey, that's how you did last time. I discovered that every marriage that is good paid the price of forgiveness. What do I mean? Every marriage, they have people that argue on everything. I have counseled people. That's what I do with my life. They, have, they argue on sex, on children, on the in-laws, on money, on what else you argue on, on who would drive, who would not drive. Me and my wife, we don't argue. We always agree. 
The only thing is she never dries here. No, I forgive her. I, I, did I mention it again? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. So that, I didn't know I said that out. So do what I preach, not what I. But, but jokes apart, jokes apart. The, the, the reality is this. I discovered that those marriages that are good, they've learned the heart of forgiving each other, wiping the slate clean every time. This does not exist. Every day they start afresh. Are you willing to start afresh with your spouse every day? If you are not willing, don't get married. If you are married, repent. No, what I mean is this. You are in it already. So you got to realize that you're messing up. Because each day you start with something that it did yesterday. The sun has already gone down on your hunger. You've sinned. You're wrong. You have the one that something is wrong with. That is why for the sake of our relationship with God, for the sake of our relationship with God, he has forgiven us all our sins, present, the past, present, and future. He said, as far as the east is from the west, he's removed that transition from us. Not for our sake, for his own sake. He's not holding account any sin. Are you here with me? So there was a, there was a story of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a little girl. The little girl said, oh, guys, she was in the group. She said, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. And people were laughing at her. Say, you didn't see Jesus. Who are you? Will you see Jesus? You are too small. Jesus, you're not holy enough. She said, no, but I saw Jesus. She kept on insisting. And one elderly man looked at her and said, did you really see Jesus? She said, yeah, I saw Jesus. I said, okay. The next time Jesus appears to you, I want you to ask him a question for me. And the, lady, the girl said, what question? So when you see Jesus next time, ask him the last sin I committed. And the guy said, I will ask. I will ask. And then she came back. The next guy said, I saw Jesus again. I saw Jesus. And everybody doubted him. Doubted her. And the, the man said, did you remember to ask Jesus about my last sin? And the lady said, yes, I did. So what did Jesus say? He said, Jesus looked and thought for a while. I said, the sin he committed, the sin he committed, um, I can't remember. Because he doesn't remember your sin. He does not. It's in his word. It will be a valuation of his word if he remembers your sin. You are the one that the devil reminds of your sin every time. God doesn't. Jesus doesn't. The Holy Ghost doesn't. That's why he said there is therefore no, now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. For your sin to be accounted to you is for the sin of Jesus to be accounted to him. And he doesn't have any sin. Are you here with me? Are you here with me? But marriage represents Jesus and the church. If he doesn't remember your sin, even though you keep on sinning, like this one keeps on sinning every day. She looks at me, she's sinning. She does her hair, she's sinning. I wasn't talking about you, I was talking about doctor. Can you say doctor? She's not making us concentrate in church. Can you imagine? She's married. Oh, she's married. Don't, she's deceiving us. But my point is this. The cost of marriage is to trust afresh every day. Can you do that? Can you pay the price? Because if your marriage is not working, then you know why it's not working. The third cost is work. Say work. Work. For some reasons. Mom, we thought when we get married, automatically our love will see us through. Our feelings will see us through. What is it? I love you. You love me. What else? Two. I used to say it. How do you say it in English? Two, gay four. <laughs> four divides two. It's just perfect. It's got to two. But you, you know what? What they're trying to say is you met your, your, your bone of your bone of, that everything is just perfect. We just feed ourselves. We just think we'll have life eternal. This is heaven on earth. Only for to discover that ah, it's not working. Why? Because you see, marriage is work. Why? When God created Adam, Adam means male and female. The first thing he gave them is work. Every other thing that comes after is work. Don't let them deceive you. Even salvation, they work out the salvation with fear and trembling. Huh? Are you getting what I'm trying to say? It is work. I want you to do something. Please stay here. Please stay here. Marriage is a collision of two, two different histories. This guy is 500, no, 50, uh, sorry, he's 18 years old. He was living his life. She was living a life like you were living your life. 
everything he sees today is influenced by his experiences, his successes, his failures, his trials, his triumph. I don't know what happened to her body. All she sees today, she sees through the lens of everything that has happened to her, whether good or bad. She is influenced by the family she grew up in, whether good or bad. Are you here with me? What happens in our relationship is that these two people are trying to create a future with different histories. Come together. How do you merge what is unmergeable if there is no compromise? Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Whose eyes do we see through in this marriage? Is it his or ours? Because when he described the spider, as much as she tried, she still missed some things. When we try to communicate, every word you say, you put your experience into it, your emotions into it, your history into it, your future into it, your past into it, and you expect your spouse to understand it. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You expect them to see what you see without the experience you have. And you now blame them when you don't even understand them. Moreover, he is a man. She is a woman. Naturally, we see differently. We perceive differently. But yet, we want to act as one. To merge the two, can you try to do your hand together? You know, like, yeah, like, like, yeah, like, together, like, no, no, like this. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I want it to there. If both of them stay the same way, they will never merge. But for them to become stronger, there must be a lot of work to shift and shift and shift and shift. Working together while there are frictions and conflict, knowing that their focus is on making their marriage work, trying to understand the other person's view, not, um, not ignoring, not saying their views are illegitimate, their desires are illegitimate, but knowing that together we've got to work hard to try to make this work. Marriage is work. Marriage can be sweaty. Marriage means both sides must be willing to compromise to forget their past and their future and their experiences knowing that they have to create a new line. That is why you shall leave your father and your mother and you shall become one flesh. What he's saying is that you shall leave your source. You shall leave what started you. You shall leave your history and create a new lineage with your spouse. The problem is you're trying to force them to come to your way. They are trying to force you to come to their way. Nobody is compromising. Are you willing to compromise? On your standard. Because Jesus compromised on his standard. He walked. He's still working on you. God is the one that works in you to will and to do. For you to have a great marriage, you must be willing to work. And work takes time. Are you here with me? Work. Did you say work? Work takes time. Thank you. One of the things I used to tell people is this. When we speak, we expect our words to have immediate impact. So, Michael has told you, Irene, he expects you to know what he has told you. He's told like three, four times. So he expects that he has told you, why are you not reacting to his word? I used to believe that until God told me that you must be more powerful than me. I said, what do you mean I'm more powerful than you? God told me that. He said, ah, you are stronger. You are, you are, you are, I want to be like you. God was telling me. I'm like, ah, what are you talking about? God said, listen, the word of God, as pure as it is, is called seed. Seed. He said, the word of God is seed. When God gives you his word, he expects, it, he expects time for you to grow and turn to fruit. So God, when he releases his word to you, we wait for you for years for you to bear fruits in you. He doesn't expect you to react immediately. 
because he knows that you don't even understand half of what he's saying. That's why when you still read your Bible, every day you still don't understand half of it. Because the word of God is seed that grows and becomes fruit. He said, but you, that you are speaking, your word that is not pure. You speak and you expect your, your spouse to have fruit immediately. So you get upset because you're not seeing the fruit. I told you to dress this way. You're not dressing that way. Are you deaf? No. The reality is that your word is not pure enough to bear fruit immediately. God's word, as strong as it is, takes time to bear fruit. Unless we are patient to understand that marriage takes work and it takes time. Because if you don't understand that, you expect changes to happen now. I used to say this also. Ladies, this is good for you. You don't water seed with seed, right? You don't plant seed and then you put more seed. What you do is you water seed with water. Is that how to say it? English word? You water seed with water. Most of us, though, we water our seed with words. We nag and nag and nag and nag and nag. Saying the same thing. I'm thinking that's what will bear fruits. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? You've got to understand that when you say something, you find a way of encouraging your spouse to get it. It's patience, long-suffering, being deliberate. Are you getting me? The last one is this. The fourth cost is honor. Say honor. What do I mean? Honor. The Bible says marriage is honorable. That's where we started from. You must honor marriage. You didn't say honor the people. What does that mean? I used to be confused. What does that mean? To honor marriage and not honor the people. Yes, you should honor the people there. But you must be committed to the marriage for it to work. If you think there's an exit, you will find it. If you're always looking for a door out of your marriage, you will eventually find it. But until you, unless both parties are committed to making this marriage work, I can promise you, one day you will look and see the exit point. It might be a man. It might be a woman. It might be your children. It might be money. Whatever it is, you will find the exit. But you say, let me explain it. Let me explain it. Marriage is an institution, right? How many of you go to work and you don't like the place you work at times? So you can leave, right? But you see, if you are committed to the place you are working, you might not like your fellow employee, but you work with them to make it work because the vision is greater than the individual. The result you're trying to get in the company means that you overlook individual differences and make it work. The challenge is that now, these days, we don't honor marriage enough to be able to stay in marriage to make it work because we don't understand the benefits of marriage. And the reason why we don't understand is because we've not been taught. And because we've not been taught, we have not taken advantages of marriage. If you know the benefits of marriage, you know it's worth it. You know how to get the benefits out of it. Some of us, the reason why we are working and making it work with our fellow employees is because of what they are paying us. You know that if I leave today, Unger will fire me. Big, sorry, Unger will, you know, it's an, it's an, I'm looking like American, you know, the, as I'll, be, I'll become hungry. I'll, I'll be, yeah. <laughs> you know, she's, she's esteeming me, praising me. It will be your weakness and craziness. But my last point is this, guys. Unless you give honor to your marriage and you esteem it above the person in there and you're committed to marriage, unless you have the commitment to say, till death do us part, you will always look for a way out. That's why God is committed to us. You see, the only person that can stop you from going to heaven is you. There's nothing you can do that will change God's mind about you. I can tell you that. The only person is you. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? But that is the same thing with marriage. Unless you are committed to your spouse to say, look, I, I, I have my, I can say this because he will allow me to say it. My pastor, Reverend Victor, and his wife, they went through rocky periods. But he told me, he said, what kept us together is we said, we are not going anywhere. He said that we make it work or we make it work. We are stuck together. So he said that we make our lives miserable, but we are together. Or we start making our life better. We start compromising. We start deciding how to make this work. Unless you decide that you're going to honor marriage above all and make it work, it will not work. Are you there with me? Did you get something out of it? 
I know I preach good. Clap for me. I'm so good. I'm so anointed. You don't preach now, preach myself. 